Our Markets Wiki questions exploring financial technology interactive video series examine the intersection of technology and the financial markets by posing seven critical questions to dozens of market and technology experts. For our culminating event in Chicago, we've invited seven of these experts to further investigate these questions. It's been an evolution uh, toward automation. It certainly didn't happen all at once. Um, and in, in some ways, May 6th of 2010, I think, was our, was our Dale Earnhardt moment in financial markets. You may recall Dale Earnhardt was a NASCAR driver who died in a tragic accident. Uh, somebody helped me. Where was it? Talladega? No, I forget. In any case, no NASCAR fans? Daytona. Daytona. Uh, and, uh, and one of the contributing factors to his, uh, his death was that um, the helmet he was wearing was not um, properly screwed on uh, and bolted, I think, to the, uh, to the seat behind him. Uh, and uh, and uh, at that time, a lot, I think a lot of racers felt that uh, to follow the rules, which were more guidelines than rules, uh, was an infringement upon their competitive advantage. They really, the, the drivers uh, viewed themselves as, uh, as cowboys uh, who, uh, who really value their ability to turn their heads and look around, and if they were to follow all the rules, it would infringe upon their competitive advantage, put them uh, at a disadvantage relative to the other racers, maybe, who, who didn't follow the rules. But, um, of course, subsequent to his death, um, tragedy led to soul searching. And the entire racing industry decided that, you know, it's not good for us. It's not good for other racers on the track. It's certainly not good for drivers involved in crashes. It's not good for the organization. It's not good for fans. Nobody likes that kind of tragedy. And I think in some ways, um, the events of May 6, 2010, even though it wasn't uh, really had any, didn't have anything to do with high frequency trading, that it did lead to a certain amount of soul searching in the financial markets. That certainly uh, it could have been, uh, at least a, 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 as people initially thought, had been high frequency trading that, that caused this kind of thing, or certainly <laughs> could, be, could be in the future. Um, and, and lest we let the regula regulators, or worse, the press, do our soul searching for us, uh, I thought it was uh, an interesting idea to take a look at the regulatory landscape where it ends and uh, where a discussion of industry-wide ethics might, uh, might take off. Uh, it, in lieu of rules-based regulations, which are forever going to be behind the pace of innovation, if, if regulation, uh, rule-based regulations were intending to keep up with the pace of innovation, uh, the amount of money it would take and the amount of time it would take to keep up with every innovation would certainly be prohibited. It's just not going to work. The government has, has, I think, rightly decided on principle-based regulation. And one of the most recent uh, uh, principles to come out from both the SEC and the CFTC was this idea of recklessness. Uh, market manipulation has long been prohibited by uh, regulatory agencies but of course, what constitutes regulation, I'm sorry, what constitutes manipulation is uh, not quite clear. But it was clear that to prosecute a case of market manipulation against a particular uh, trader or firm was that they had to prove a manipulative outcome, uh, but also prove a malicious intent. But in light of the recent SEC and CFTC regulations, the, the bar has been lowered to simply one of recklessness, which is we don't have to prove you intended to have a, have a manipulative outcome. We simply need to prove that you were irresponsible in, uh, in, uh, in causing that rec a manipulative outcome. Uh, so then you say, well, if I had a trading system that uh, went haywire, and they do on occasion, I was just talking to a former student just last week who said, you know, we had a trading system. Uh, we coded it up. We let it rip to see what happened. The thing lost $100,000 in a minute or two, and we shut it off. Uh, so these kinds of things still happen. Whether they make the headlines or not, um, it's still there. So as I mentioned, uh, lest we let the, uh, the press or the regulators, regulators 
define uh, what, our, what the soul of our industry is about, I think it is a good opportunity for us to uh, examine what ethics are in the new age of automation. Ethics has long been part and parcel of finance and going as far back as the, the prudent man rule and subsequent exchange rules of prohibitions against certain trading activities, uh, cornering the market, uh, watch trading, these kinds of things, uh, uh, certain trading strategies, but also certain kinds of behaviors, smoking, fighting, uh, wearing a, a coat, a funny colored coat on the floor. So uh, ethics and rules and regulations have, have always been part, but things have changed in the age of automation. We're now in an interdisciplinary world, automation is by its nature an interdisciplinary endeavor. So the, the ethics that applied to uh, traders maybe don't uh, apply quite so much uh, in the way uh, that they used to. Um, but if you read the press, you know, the press would like to make this out that, uh, you know, all these high frequency traders, uh, they have no ethics. And so I think that there is a discrepancy between what I hear in the press and what I see in the industry because even just here at IIT we've had conferences, Mike, we had a conference last year where there was a heated debate between a floor trader and, uh, and a high frequency trader about the ethics of liquidity provision and I think it's got a little nasty but both, both of them are arguing, I think, arguing from an ethical perspective, both believe that they were ethically correct and I think that in, in in, uh, in the absence of an overarching ethical framework in the age of automation, uh, we're left to see the disjointedness of the ethical landscape. And I've tried to provide a little structure and point out that uh, uh, things can happen in financial markets that have unethical outcomes, where each of the uh, disciplines <coughs> Uh, has their own ethical perspective. Each can claim that they were ethically correct. And that really the perspective, uh, the perception of a lack of ethics, I think, really comes out of uh, the fact that in this interdisciplinary world, uh, there needs to be a new discussion of ethics that spans all these uh, functional areas. So uh, traditionally, uh, the computer ethics might uh, focus on things like fail safe code if the system breaks, if the plane is flying on autopilot uh, can, and something goes wrong, can we land the plane safely without a uh, loss of life? So that's typically sort of an engineering or computer science sort of ethics, ethical perspective. Uh, traders, I think, have traditionally focused on, on the, um, the important service that the traders provide to create orderly, orderly markets. And so they, a lot of traders believe very strongly in their contribution to creating uh, orderly markets. Uh, quants, um, usually ethics and quantitative analysis is superseded by uh, some adherence to mathematical truth. Uh, but nevertheless, as long as, the, uh, as long as the quantified trading decisions don't run afoul of the rules and regulations of the exchange, or uh, the, the, um, the truth-based nature of mathematics, that, that's what uh, that's what the quants ethics is largely about. And of course the exchanges as enablers of high frequency trading have their own perspective, which is the creation of fair markets. And what happens, for example, in uh, the case of the flash crash, you may, may remember uh, the guys over at Tradeworks, a high frequency trading firm in New Jersey, uh, you know, they said, look, the market was crashing, we believed that it was a, a, a problem with the market infrastructure. And we thought that to profit at the expense of other market participants because of the uh, failure of the market infrastructure, that would be unethical. So we turned our machine off. In retrospect, you know, he said it would have been our best trading day ever had we left our machine on. But we made an ethical decision. Likewise, and I think that's very much sort of a fail-safe perspective on, on uh, the flash crash. Whereas if you talk to a trader, a trader might take the alternative ethical position and say, look, the market is in uh, a, a crisis. The best thing we can do ethically is to continue to provide liquidity to the markets. And so depending upon your ethical perspective, uh, what your professional background is, you may have a conflict with uh, other uh, functional areas. And so um, what we've tried to do in the research uh, lately 
uh, that I've been doing is to try and structure the discussion of this uh, interprofessional, interdisciplinary ethical realm that we now live in, uh, lest um, the press and the regulators tell us what it is for us. Um, and, uh, and that's all I have to say about that. I, I also want to mention, before I'm done, if you just give me one second, is I'd like to introduce Moshe. Moshe is a, uh, the president of Aspiritech. Aspiritech is this uh, fantastic company. They do software testing for financial firms. And, and the great thing about his firm is they use special, very special people with uh, high-functioning autism. Um, but these people are fantastic, um, very focused, and, uh, and able to focus uh, on, on, on things like software testing uh, in, in, uh, for very long periods of time. Uh, so they do it better, and uh, they do it less expensively, and they do it um, in, in, a, in the right way. Uh, many financial firms are working with you already, and, uh, and uh, these people, uh, as you said yourself, it's not in their DNA to lie. And so security is less of an issue in this case, which is, uh, is important, which is, uh, in any case, to say that it might in some way be possible to do well by doing good. Thank you.